Hi folks, leak testing. It's probably one of the most nerve-wracking parts of any water-cooled build, because it's that moment you switch the build on and the fluid goes around and you find out that you've missed out a stop fitting on the back of your GPU and you've just poured coolant over your entire motherboard and power supply. Well, I'm gonna show you a couple methods of how I do it and how you can do it to avoid all of these errors and to make sure that building your loop is as simple as possible. We're gonna be using the Antec build that we did earlier just to show you how to lay it out along with some other components that I'm gonna be building on the bench just to show you different alternative methods so you can do it at home easily. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be using the Antec system just so we can demonstrate exactly how to do the leak testing itself. I've got a card here so you can see the actual leak testing we did when we made the build originally, but for now, the fill system is going to be fine because it's really just a matter of showing where you put things, what you do with the cables and so on. So the first step you're going to want to do is make sure you haven't actually got anything connected because we're going to be powering it on using just the pump. To do that means we need to have the power supply fully bridged. To switch on the power supply, you're going to need to jump it and that means using one of these. This is a bridging clip. It's basically just a connector which has a wire connecting two of the different wires together. You're going to want to insert that into the 24 pin over here, and that will bridge the power supply, allowing the current to run through and switching on the pump. The thing is, it does make everything live. So for that reason, I think it's a good idea not to have the GPU plugged in or the eight pin of the CPU. You can have some of the other things plugged in. Fans are perfectly fine. I find that's a good idea because then you can diagnose it more easily. But I would also not plug in things like hard drives or SSDs. Whilst many power supplies nowadays actually come with these bridging clips, not everyone's going to have one. So how do you do it if you don't have one? Well, all you need is something like a staple, or in my case, a paper clip, because all this really does is connect two pins together, one with a ground and one with a live. So if you just do the same with one of these, you have exactly the same effect. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Simply bend into a U shape. And with the 24 pin cable arranged like so, simply plug into the third and fourth terminals. Now normally at this point the rig would still be empty. Ours is full because we did it earlier, but again it's going to be exactly the same process. What you do is you take some paper towels and you place them strategically around the rig. So a good one here would be to place one on top of the graphics card. Place another one directly underneath the reservoir. Maybe I'll put one here between the top tubes and the radiator. And then put maybe one final one around the CPU block. So these towels perform two tasks. First one, which seems obvious, is if there are any leaks, they're going to catch the coolant. So you're not going to have it flooding around the PC itself. Because you're not having the PC on, that's not really going to cause problems. You can just take the components out and dry them, but it does save you a lot of time because obviously if anything leaks into, say, the graphics card, you're going to have to maybe take the whole thing apart, dry it out. It could be a couple days, at least several hours before I would use it again. So this will definitely help in that regard unless it's something truly catastrophic. The other thing is that with these towels, a lot of the time you're going to be using a, a coolant with a colouring in it, maybe blue, orange, uh, red, very common ones. Having a white towel or a blue towel, blue towels are particularly good for clear coolants, but I've got white ones. If you use a towel, you can more easily see the leak against, say, the backdrop. If you've got, say, nothing here, the leak will go into the towel, it will spread, and you'll be able to see that it's damp and that something has changed. So it's a good idea to be able to look and see what's going on, especially if you have a contrasting colour at play. Now there's one little detail that's really important that I can't stress enough. Have a good drainage system. When you're planning a loop, if you have a good drain system, if there are any leaks, if there's anything which has gone wrong, you'll be able to remove all the fluid very quickly. Because say you've got a CPU loop issue here. So if we had one of these fittings leaking at the top, we could simply open this valve fitting with a tube coming out of it, and the majority of the coolant would then flood out minimizing the amount of water damage or kind of leaking onto the actual plate itself. So that makes things much quicker and much easier and I would thoroughly recommend making sure you spend the time to put in a proper drain system that will be effective. It will save you many times in the future, not least because maintenance is easier as well. So the next step, now that we've got this bridged and we've got our paper towels in place, 
is we're going to cycle the pump and then we're going to get the fluid going around the system itself. Again, ours is full, so we're not going to be going all the way through the first time, but you normally only need to cycle it a few times anyway until you can get to this exact stage. Now just remember when you're doing the pump cycling, you don't want the reservoir ever to completely empty out. You always want to make sure that there's some water going down there into the pump, because if the pump runs dry, they could run the risk of overheating and getting damaged, and it happens quite quickly. You don't want it to happen at all. So in this one, as I said before, we're filled up. But normally, the reservoir would go down to the bottom, and then you switch it off. To, to do the actual pump cycling, all you need to do is switch the power supply on on the switch on the back. So that's what we're going to do now. So normally, I switch it on, the coolant would start to cycle through, it would get to the bottom, and then I go and switch it off again. And then you top it up and repeat and repeat until it's basically at a level that you're happy with. So the leak testing element itself happens at this stage. We filled it up, it's all throughout the loop. You're going to now be bleeding the air out of the system. But whilst this happens, you're also going to be checking for any leaks. Then there's different kinds of leaks that could happen, and you want to make sure that you're secured against both. The first kind is going to be the catastrophic really quick leak. Now you'll see that very fast. If it comes out, if the, if the fitting's maybe not tightened properly, or something's a bit crooked, or a thread isn't quite engaged, then you'll see a fair bit of fluid will come out quite quickly, hopefully get caught up by the towels, which will save you in the long run, and then you can sort it out, either by draining the system or by just fiddling things around as you're doing it. I would recommend draining it, but sometimes it's not really necessary. The thing is, you want to keep doing this for a few hours. Really, anywhere between three hours and 24 hours for a leak test is pretty normal. If you're doing them on a very frequent basis, you might do it shorter, just because you sort of know what to look out for and the sort of things that can happen. But either way, it's worth spending a little bit of time making sure that it's left powered on with just the pump. You can also have the fans running. That's not a bad idea because the pumps do actually introduce heat into the loop and you don't want it to you know, expand too much if you maybe haven't got as much airflow without the fans. If you, have a more, if you have a case which has got decent airflow, it's not really a problem. The amount of wattage being put in from the pump is going to be quite minimal for a large radiator, so it's not going to be an issue, but it's worth considering. The other thing is that leaks can happen very slowly. Sometimes something like a, a drain valve might have a very, very slow leak that can occur over a matter of days. I had one recently where I installed a valve and actually it leaked from the inside of the valve and it took two days to get a few drips out. Now, that's not gonna cause any real problems. It was a bit of a pain, so I had to drain the system so I could reinstall a new working valve, but having that time really helped in that case. But there is a better way. Well, I say better, it's a way that I prefer now because there's less risk and there's less faff for when things do go wrong. And that's instead of using coolant, you use air pressure instead. So air pressure testing is a really handy method for leak testing, mostly because it doesn't put any fluid through the system, but it also simulates the increase in pressure that a loop will experience during use. So of course, as the loop warms up, the pressure inside the system is going to increase a little bit, and that's gonna put some strain on components. And it's not gonna have the same effect as if you just ran some fluid through it without any actual load. This is particularly true for testing things like distribution panels, because if you just put a load of liquid in this, it will most likely hold. If you put, any, put it under pressure, then it's going to behave quite differently and it will find any cracks that are available, the fluid will leak out of it, and you'll have be in for a bad day, especially if you've gone and installed one of these into the case itself, because sometimes they can be a real pain to remove. And I'm gonna show you why it's so important to test them beforehand. So the device I use to pressure test my systems is one of these. It's an Aqua Computer Dr. Drop. It's basically a little manual manometer that's attached to a Delrin block with a valve in it. You then attach that to this little bicycle pump, connect the other side to the loop with just standard tubing and a fitting, pump it up, and then watch if the pressure drops. The idea being you pump it up to about 0.5 to 0.6 bar, and then you leave it. You leave it between 15 minutes and maybe a couple of hours, or even overnight. The idea is if your loop is leak free, there won't be any air escaping from it at those pressure levels. That means when you come back to it, your pressure will still be at 0.5 bar. Now it's important not to overinflate, so I quite like this tiny little bicycle bump it comes with because the bigger ones, it's quite easy to go too far. And if you push the pressure up too much, 
then some of the components are likely to fail. Radiators are a big one for this. Most of them are only tested up to about 0.6 bars. Some of the more industrial ones can even go up to 10 bar, but they're uncommon. And if you buy one, you probably know that you bought one. It's better just to go with the standard 0.6. It's fine for a standard system unless something goes catastrophically wrong, in which case you've probably got other problems anyway. So I'm gonna show you how to use one of these, why it's so particularly handy for working with distro plates, and also going to be using it on just a random bench top loop that we've just set up with some spare components, showing you how you can use it. Maybe if, for instance, you bought something like an MSI um, Seahawk card that comes with a block pre-installed or an EVGA hydrocopper. Those ones are hard to test without actually putting a loop in them. So it's a good idea to be able to test it beforehand without any coolant, just to make sure you haven't got a dead card when it arrives. So to use the dot to drop, first you take a piece of tubing and a fitting, screw it into the actual body of the device itself, and you want to have that nice and tight. Then you take the other end and you screw it into the item that you're testing. In this case, I'm going to be using this distro plate that I made for the LDLC build. With the tube now connected to the distro plate, you take the little pump and attach it to the fitting on the side. Right, now it's time to pressurize the system. And you do that just by using the little pump. Ooh, oh dear, that doesn't look so good. Problem here is that the needle is not going above 0.1 bar, and that means that there's a pretty serious leak in the system. It's not holding any pressure at all. Now, this is the reason why I quite like using this method, because it would have been quite difficult to spot that beforehand with this particular plate, because it has no visible O-rings and no sealant. Instead, it's got a glue ring all around the inside, which is very difficult to check. Clearly somewhere that glue is not properly bonded and the air is leaking out of it very quickly. If I put this into the system and then tried a normal leak test, the coolant would have come out, likely would have gone all over the place and I'd have had a big cleaning job. Plus, this is deadline sensitive, I may not have been able to make a new plate in time. As such, because I could test it before putting it into the system, I was able to make a new plate with an enhanced design that solved this issue. So to help demonstrate it, I've got this handy little table loop here that we're going to be filling up with air, seeing if it holds pressure, and if it does, I'll show you exactly how long and what you want to do with it. If it doesn't, we'll see where we can maybe do better. As with before, we attach the dot to drop, use the pump to put air into the system, and then put it up to about 0.6 bar. Then I let it down to 0.5 and then left it there. How long you leave it there is up to you. I find that after about 15 minutes, if it's about the same, it's probably okay. But you can leave it for several hours. In the instructions, they do say anywhere between sort of half an hour and four hours is a good time to leave it. You can also leave it overnight. If it goes down a little bit, you may know that you've got a very, very slow leak. Wouldn't be a real problem, but it's worth checking things out. The only problem with using this method is that if it does leak, it's very difficult to figure out where the leak comes from. So if you do find that you've got a leaky uh, component within the loop, the best advice is to disconnect individual tubes and then test along short runs. That way you can isolate exactly where the leak is coming from. So for instance, in a loop like this, you'd want maybe to disconnect between the CPU and the pump, and then you could put the dot drop here, and then you could put a stop fitting on the radiator maybe. That takes the pump out of the equation. If it doesn't leak, then you know you've got a leaky fitting on the pump. Maybe something's not been tightened up. Maybe something's been tightened up too much, or maybe something's just not in there properly. Same goes for maybe the reservoir. Is it fully tightened? Is the tube going to be all, all the way in? Things like that. That's what you've got to look out for. The great thing about obviously using this method is that you don't have to worry about having the pump actually on, any power going through the system, proper coolant or anything like that. And it, as I said, it's great for complicated loops with big distro blades. I used it a lot in the 1000D and it really helped there because trying to leak test something that big, so many variables, it's really hard. So hopefully that's given you some ideas and tips on how to leak test your system. In addition, if you don't want to have to buy a pre-made product such as the Dr. Drop, you can actually make one yourself. You can use components bought from Amazon, eBay, anywhere, such as I've got this one here, which is handy because it's digital so I can read it more easily. Um, and just using off-the-shelf components, you can actually construct your own version of a Dr. Drop that's probably going to be more durable because it can all be made out of solid brass, solid components and things like that. Because the problem with these devices is they have a little acetyl thread on here and this has a habit of snapping. So over time, when you use it more and more, they can snap. So having your own one is probably not a bad idea. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in a future video. So catch you then.